Support for Starting Small comes from Human Scale, the leading designer and manufacturer of high-performance ergonomic products that help create a healthier work life. All of the products from chairs to standing desk and more are comfortable, easy to use, and sustainable, and great for either the office or the work from home environment. With an increase in shifting workplaces, comfort can be especially hard to find. As I run the podcast, I'm in front of my desk for hours a day, from scheduling, researching, interviewing, and more. Human Scale allows me to remain productive without the consequence of body stress to follow. Make sure to check out Human Scale at humanscale.com and use code starting small at checkout to save 20% off your purchase. That's code starting small at humanscale.com and enjoy the episode. Hello, and thank you for tuning in to Starting Small, a podcast about brand development, entrepreneurship, and innovation in the modern world. In this episode, I'm joined by Bill Phelps, co founder of Wetzel's Pretzels, an American franchise of fast food restaurants specializing in the variety of pretzel types. While on a business trip for Nestle, Bill and his co-founder Rick discovered a pretzel store in a mall with fresh pretzels and low cost of goods, but that existing store had poor marketing. This was their chance to hop in and revolutionize the pretzel industry. Hello, and thank you for tuning in to Starting Small. Today, I'm joined by Bill Phelps of Wetzel's Pretzels. Bill, thank you so much for joining me today. It's nice to be with you. Yeah, so I want to start out with your upbringing. So where did you grow up and what was your childhood like? Uh, I grew up just south of Boston, a little town called Hingham, Massachusetts. And my dad was uh, a businessman and worked for a traditional uh, leather products company for most of his career. And then uh, he came up with the idea of the rawhide dog boat and actually was an entrepreneur himself and went out and did a LBO before they were very common. Mm -hmm. And they bought the company back from the founders and he took over the pet product side of the business and his partner took over the leather product side of the business. Um, But it's a pretty cool story. Wow, so growing up as a kid and your dad uh, coming up with this idea of the rawhide dog bone. What was that like in your position? Did you Were you allowed to kind of aid uh, in your premature ear, years with your father's business? Uh, no, not really. Uh, yeah. But we. the funny thing was, and it happened in Wetzel's too, but uh, he, you know, I told people that my dad made dog bones and people laughed at me. <laughs> <You know? laughs> And people laughed when I told them I started a pretzel company. But you know, wow, it just turns out better. Yeah, for sure. So for yourself, did you did you have an entrepreneurship mindset growing up? Say any lemonade stands or sell any products? Um, not really. But interestingly, though, I always thought about being in the franchise business because I thought it was a great model to be a franchisor. Mm -hmm. and to build a brand and uh, have the royalty stream. Uh, I always thought that would be an interesting model. So uh, that was way before any of these other businesses. So where do you think that fascination came from? Was your father into franchising as well, or where did this come from? No, no, he was just a a traditional entrepreneur, brick and mortar factories, and and, and he was very successful at uh, the different brands that he helped develop. And then I worked from, for him after college um, and helped build that business. Got it. So backtrack a little bit. Let's go into your college years then. In 1978, you went to Middlebury College. What did you study there? I was an economics major there. Uh, and it was uh, pretty grueling. Middlebury has been ranked in the top five of the liberal arts colleges and it was hard when i went there and it was harder now yeah but i really learned uh, analysis and i really learned how to write well and that's probably the best thing i got out of the school i was also on the basketball team there that's how i get in awesome so with basketball did you go on scholarship or what what did that look like no, but uh, I'm, I'm dating myself here. <laughs> the entire uh, first year cost $3,600 room, board, and tuition. Wow. 
<laughs> so amazing. You didn't need a scholarship back then. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, so it was pretty. What would you say was your overall experience like with your years at Middlebury then? Oh, it, it was a it was a great experience. Uh, really challenging, and I've put myself in these positions over the years where I am kind of over my head, and I have to really grind mm -hmm. to get through. And and I learned to do that at Middlebury, and I did it a number of times throughout my career. Amazing. So you mentioned shortly after you went ended up working for your father. Um, so what led you to then uh, go the route towards working with uh, Rawhide Dog Bones with your father in 1983? Well, I was I worked for Carnation Company right out of college, and they had a brand management program, mm -hmm. and I loved that. And I learned uh, marketing at Carnation Company, and I actually worked in their pet care division, and I worked on a couple of the big cat food brands, uh, and that was a great experience. And then I went back and worked with my dad, uh, and we built it up from probably a twenty million dollar business when I got there to about a seventy million dollar business in nineteen ninety. Wow. And then I made the decision that we were too small to compete in the industry, surrounded by multi billion dollar multinationals. And so I made the decision uh, with my dad's blessing to reach out to uh, Nestle mm. and see if they were interested in doing a deal. So, yeah, when, when you initiated that, and uh, this was around 1990, um, yeah. what were uh, some of the responses you got back from Nestle at that time and along with your father's uh, collaboration? Uh they were interested. They looked at it as a very good acquisition for them. They were a big pet products company with no position in the treat uh, dog treat side of the business. And so they decided that they wanted to be in that business. And the deal just made sense for all parties. Uh, and it was a great deal for my dad and uh, for my sister and myself. Uh, and it was it was great. And then I got a job offer from Nestle to incorporate the brand into Nestle's organization. And so I worked in the pet care division for about two years. And then I moved over to the fresh products division for a couple of years. And again, it was a challenging job, uh, but I learned a ton. And Nestle is an absolutely world-class company for sure. and I learned a ton from working there and then I met Rick Wetzel there yeah and the story was and that, that this is the fun part so the story was Rick had heard about pretzel stores on the east coast and so we were on a business trip to Seattle mm -hmm. and we walked into this mall and there was uh, this pretzel company and we could see the product was fresh and the fresh products at Nestle were really hot and it was fresh and it perceived as low calorie because it's a pretzel uh, versus a cinnamon roll or a cookie, whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, we saw the cost of goods would be low and the marketing on the company that was there wasn't very exciting. And we said we could do it better than them. So we walked uh, to a restaurant where we were going to have dinner that night, went to the bar and grabbed a napkin and we wrote a business plan on the back of a napkin. Wow. And uh, it looked really exciting. And on the flight back down to Los Angeles, I said to Rick Wetzel, we will have a store open by November. And we opened a store by November, which is pretty crazy. Wow, that, that's amazing. So how were you handling this bandwidth uh, while working with Nestle? Did you end up leaving the organization before uh, I know we left right at the end and Nestle was consolidating divisions. They were going to move, they moved our division back to Cleveland. Okay. And so they were offering uh, uh, severance packages and I took one and Rick took one and we ran out and started the business. Wow. So going into this brand new industry, how did uh, you guys manage to create this uh, pretzel brand from the ground up? Uh, I don't know if you had any, 
um, idea with recipes in the past or did you transfer? Oh, that's actually a really good question. We had yeah. a third partner for the first six months and he was another guy from Nestle. Okay. Uh, and his name was Steve Phillips and Steve Phillips was a chef. Oh. And he had trained at uh, the Culinary Institute of America uh, and he uh, came, I also lived in Philadelphia. So he knew baking and he knew pretzels and he came up with a recipe and we all tasted it and we were blown away and so we started making them for landlords our landlord prospects and then we got a, a deal and we moved ahead and tried it wow what was that original pretzel was it just uh kind of the classic well, well we but, but we decided to do it very early on the idea was to be the ben and jerry's of okay. the pretzel business and so we came up with, we had original pretzels, uh, and then we had sinful cinnamon pretzels, and then we had uh, cheese and garlic, and we had uh, jalapeno pretzels, and we had uh, oh, about three or four other varieties, uh, garlic pretzels and things like that. So we were kind of the, the innovators in the category. And that's how we positioned ourselves from very early on. I hope you guys are enjoying this episode so far around Bill's entrepreneurial journey. I'd like to pause and say thank you to this episode's mid-break sponsor, Solomon. Premium outdoor shoes, apparel, and accessories. With running outdoors being a major stress reliever for my work, I count on Solomon to carry me through each and every workout. Solomon strives to create progressive gear to enable you to freely enjoy and challenge yourself in the great outdoors. Make sure to check out Solomon for yourself at Solomon.com and enjoy the rest of the episode. Your first location uh, opens at Redondo Beach, California. Did you both, yep. did you did you acquire any funding at launch? No, we, we, we each had, uh, I had money from the sale of the uh, dog pet products company. Mm -hmm. And then, um, Rick, this is a funny story. He was an entrepreneur and started a, a video uh, rental uh, store right while he was in college, right after college. Uh, and he got money to go to business school and then he had money to do that. But he sold his Harley motorcycle <laughs> to pay for the mixer in the first store. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. That pretty but we were good at business. And we were good at marketing, but we had no idea how to run a restaurant, no idea how to franchise. Um, and so we were really winging it. And our families came down to see the operation. And the reaction was they all thought that they were looking at a train wreck. I mean, they all, they all thought it was just a disaster waiting to happen. We were sitting there behind the counter rolling pretzels and ringing the register. And it was a mess oh, uh, man. And, and they thought that we would blow it. Uh, but we learned the business and we learned it really well. And we, and the biggest surprise for me in my whole career was I thought that having franchisees would be like herding cats. Mm -hmm. And it was just the opposite of that. We learned the business from the franchisees wow. and you would watch the really good operators come up with ideas for new products or to reinvent the products you had or to uh, improve the systems, how to clean a store, uh, how to do the POS systems. All of those ideas came from the franchisees. And so we just incorporated all of those over the years and the business just got better and better. Amazing. So when you first launched this location, how many employees did you start with? Was it you and Rick actually making pretzels we worked at the pretzel store we worked in the pretzel store you wow. couldn't believe it we're sitting there in the back room mixing uh flour and uh yeast and all kinds of stuff it was crazy um but we probably had about oh, i'm thinking 15 employees and we had no idea how to manage you know <laughs> teenage kids and it was a friggin' mess yeah for six months so <laughs> but we figured it out so introducing this new uh, pretzel line, in what ways would you draw in potential customers being a pre-digital advertisement uh, era? 
Uh, well, we're in a mall. And so the, the, mall, the beauty of the malls is the malls create the traffic for you. Mm -hmm. And so you just have to be in the right location within a mall and you're going to have people coming by and seeing you. And the marketing shtick for the pretzel business was simply a line out the door. And when you would have a line out the door, the line would get longer. It was just amazing. And we would put out samples and have people sample the product. And as they sampled the product, they would get in line. And it just was a very simple business that worked really well once we, once we figured it out. So at the beginning of the conversation, you mentioned how you're always fascinated with franchising. Um, at what point did you and Rick decide that franchising was going to work out out of this mall, that you wanted to further expand the business? At what point did you guys well, realize? That's, that's a funny question. And the answer was that, uh, you know, normally if you close up a restaurant, it would take you 30 minutes to clean it up at the end of the night. Mm -hmm. or the, That's what the employees would do. Well, Rick and I were rookies at this. We had no idea what we were doing. And we took two hours to clean the restaurant. And we're walking out of the place at 11 o'clock at night. Rick Wetzel goes, this is too much work. We got to franchise these things. <laughs> That's a true story. And that happened in December of 1994. And we started franchising uh, in early 1995. Okay, so where did you begin to expand? Was this all in California or what? what Mostly the... California. And Wetzel's was uh, California based, and uh, more than half of our restaurants, our shops today, are in the California market. So it's just a huge uh, market for Wetzel's. But then we, we started franchising across the country, and we went into New Jersey, we went into Atlanta, we went into Arizona, all kinds of markets. Amazing. Um, just just a sidetrack real quick. Last night, I actually saw one of my previous guests I had on the show. He was eating a Wetzel's pretzel in California. So it, it's really yeah. Ama yeah, it's really amazing seeing that and you mentioning uh, just such a powerful California business that you guys grew. And I'm, I'm watching some of my friends and my guests actually eating Wetzel's pretzels. It's really remarkable. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. So moving on to 1997, uh, you did an angel deal with the right. mo movie producer John Davis and chairman of Northwest Airlines, Gary Wilson. If you could kind of yeah. explain that tra transition and what that looked like. Uh, it's, it's a great question. And it was a, uh, the decision of our careers. You know, my father-in-law uh, was extremely successful and my father was extremely successful. My father-in-law said, I'll, you know, loan you a million dollars if you want to help grow this business. And we, instead of taking money from family and friends, we went out and went to angel investors. Uh, and we went with angel investors because they would validate the business. We, you know, it wasn't a gift from a family member. It was really based on what they saw as the value of the business. Mm -hmm. And the other thing was that we thought they could help us with their connections, uh, get into some of the malls. And at the end, they did. Now, we started uh, overloading the overhead really quickly. Mm. And uh, it became a disaster very quickly because we weren't selling a lot of franchises. Uh, and the chairman of Northwest Airlines a year later goes, I know where this one's going. And that meaning we were going to go bankrupt. Mm. Uh, but we listened to the guys and we cut the overhead dramatically. And we started selling franchises and doing some license deals. And we turned the corner. And those guys were supportive of us. And we turned the business around. And then the breakthrough for us was, this is a fun story. We were trying to get more locations. So we sent out these postcards to a thousand landlords uh, or landlord contracts across the country. And we only got one response, but it was from Disneyland. Wow. And we uh, got a store at Disneyland and at downtown Disney. And that was the turning point of the company. We opened the store up and it was mind boggling what the store did. It did 10 times the volume, the average volume of the stores at that time. So wow. it, was, it was just amazing. 
and and we parlayed that into five locations at Walt Disney World, and that's what really got the company going. That's that's amazing. So, um, once you landed these stores inside Disneyland, um, what what did the future of Wetzel's Pretzels kind of look like to you at that time? If you guys were just beginning franchising, um, you you were progressing, but then you land these major partnerships. What did yeah. that do to you, both your intuition and the future of Wetzel's Pretzels? Would well, you say it, it was it was like we made it. That was the turning point in the company. You know, and yeah. the, the, you know that old line: the harder you work, the luckier you get. Because our business model was okay, uh, and our growth trajectory was okay. And then we sold. We got into Disneyland and Disney World, and we got all of these franchise leads, not only domestically but internationally. Mm -hmm. And the franchise growth uh, of the business uh, was really strong after that period. Wow. So eventually, uh, Rick decided to uh, depart to continue his entrepreneurial endeavors. And then you also departed. If you can kind of explain this era when Rick departed and then your departure uh, following on later. um, What led you to do that? Uh, Well... Entrepreneurs have a, a, a spirit of starting things new. Mm-hmm. They get bored. Typical entrepreneurs get bored with the same thing all the time. So uh, Rick Wetzel got bored quicker than I did, and he wanted to do something different. So he, uh, we did a private equity deal, uh, and we took uh, some pretty good money off the table. And then I stayed and ran the business, and Rick kind of got bored and he and Elise Wetzel came up with the idea of Blaze Pizza. Mm -hmm. And unlike Wetzel's, people looked at Blaze Pizza and said it was a home run. It was a build your own pizza concept. The product was phenomenal. The concept was phenomenal. And then we used uh, the same investors, uh, movie producer John Davis, and he brought Maria Shriver into the deal and we brought LeBron James into the deal. Wow. And we announced that LeBron James was an investor. And I think Rick told me we got 6,000 franchise leads in the 18 months after that announcement. Wow. And, and unlike Wetzel's that grew slowly early on, Blaze Pizza grew, uh, was the fastest growing restaurant chain in America for two of the next five years. Uh, And so they were opening up to 80 restaurants a year uh, during that time. And the business was just going great guns. And then um, we sold uh, another private equity deal on Wetzel's Mm -hmm. in 2016. And then we did a major private equity deal on Blaze Pizza in 2017. Um, and it was, it was wild and it was fun. And then at the end of, I worked for the new private equity firm for two years. And then I got ex- interested in doing other things. And so I talked to John Davis again, the movie producer, mm-hmm. and we, uh, we went with a company called Dave's Hot Chicken. And we love the product. Just an absolutely phenomenal product that's like addicting. And the stores, the one store was doing really well. And we took a flyer and we made a deal with the founders that we would own half the business and they would own half the business. And we would grow the franchise business. Wow. How young was Dave's Hot Chicken at, at that time? Dave said, this is a great question. Mm-hmm. Uh, at the end of 17, you had three guys with two nickels to rub together between the three of them. And they had opened a, a Dave's hot chicken in a parking lot in Hollywood. Okay. They did a pop-up. And the story was the guy from Eater LA came by and said, uh, this might just blow your mind. It's so good. <laughs> and so then they opened up a store at the beginning of 2018 and they had two hour lines out the door at the beginning of 18. So nine months later in the fall of 18, we connected with them 
and we made our deal at the end of 2018 and were in business franchising uh, about six months later. Wow, that's tremendous. So when you went into Dave's Hot Chicken, was your envision to be similar to Wetzel's, such as staying on the West Coast? Because uh, you eventually grew no, to 300 no, stores. No, it was, I was actually going to follow the Blaze pizza model, okay. which was to bring on a really strong group of people yeah. and, and, and franchise it nationally. And we are following, we literally have the uh, playbook uh, on my desk and on my computer. And I go back and look at what Blaze's overhead was and what they had for growth and what they had for store volumes. And uh, I've got Bla Dave's Hot Chicken is running on the same number, running on the same trend, maybe a little bit higher. Wow, that's, that's amazing. So looking at your relationship with Rick today, what does your connection look like? Uh, kind of, you're still business partners, so what does your relationship look like? We are, uh, and you're, we're lifelong partners, you know? We mm -hmm. went to war together, yeah. and we almost died a few times, <laughs> uh, and then we got lucky a few times. Uh, and he's had my back all along, I've had his back. Uh, he invested uh, in Dave's Hot Chicken, but He's not active in it. He's watching from the sidelines. And if I ever need advice, I just give him a call and, and we adjust whatever we're doing. But uh, it's been a, a great relationship. That's amazing. Bill, I like to conclude each episode with this. If you could share one piece of advice with an aspiring entrepreneur, what would that be? Maybe something you've learned or regret? Just anything. By the way, that's your best question. <laughs> um, and the biggest thing is it's all about perseverance. And you're going to get roadblocks thrown in your way. You're going to hit dead ends. You're going to have lawsuits. You're going to have all kinds of problems that you never imagined being an entrepreneur. And it's all about perseverance and sticking to it and fighting through the hard times uh, till you get to the other side. And it's that perseverance that is the difference between the guys that make it and the guys that don't. Absolutely. Well, Bill, thank you so much for joining me. And to the listeners out there, make sure to check out Wetzel's Pretzels at Wetzel's.com and Dave's Hot Chicken at Dave'sHotChicken.com. Thanks a lot. Great to talk to you. Hey, thank you for listening to this episode of Starting Small. If you would, leave a review on whatever platform you're listening on. Also, follow Starting Small Pod on social platforms to keep up to date on future guests.